Hey guys, I'm glad you guys made it out here after lunch. So we're going to talk a little bit about game theory and how it applies to the brand side. So I'll give you a quick dive into Dragon Army and then we'll kind of go backwards from there. So we are part mobile agency, part uh, game studio. So we actually have an in-house game studio. Five of our guys actually sit and create games direct for consumers. And then half of our other work is focused on the agency side. So I kind of sit somewhere in the middle of trying to learn what those guys are doing and then applying it to experiences we create. Um, but I want to go ahead and put it out there that I am not a gamer. So this is a really interesting thing as I, I was brought on to this company. Um, my husband is a huge gamer and wanted to know how in the world I ended up here. So this is actually a shot from one of our games um, called Paper Trail, which you can download in the App Store. The funny thing about this is I, I literally tried to get a screenshot of my highest score, which was 15. I think the number one score right now is in the thousands. I couldn't even get past 15 the second time, and the highest I could get back up to to grab the screenshot for you guys was seven. So hopefully one of you guys can go in there and beat it. It is not my forte whatsoever, um, but I'm, I'm trying and I'm learning. So a little bit about my background and if I'm not a gamer, so how did I end up here? So let's see. Oh. So I went to the University of Georgia, go dogs. Um, I was a cheerleader there, fun fact, in college. So kind of got that, I guess, that outgoing, a little bit of a bubbly personality. Um, after that, while I was in school, I interned over at Coca-Cola Company. So definitely a fun opportunity there. That was at kind of the time of the beginnings of social. So I started up actually all the World of Coke's social profiles and then spent some time in global interactive digital marketing doing some of our very first social listening campaigns around the FIFA World Cup. So that was a lot of fun. Um, also got some fun perks like this where you get a little bear that gets to come and give you, you know, kisses and hugs every day, which is always a fun work perk for sure. Um, from there, I moved over to Engage. So my primary account when I was there worked on a number of things, but was Chick-fil-A. So I worked on Chick-fil-A social presences. This was actually an image one year for Cow Appreciation Day. If you guys aren't familiar, day in July, you dress up like a cow and you get a free meal. So we actually did one year where we went to Philadelphia. We loaded up about 60 cows on double-decker buses and took them around the city in anticipation for Cow Appreciation Day. So that was all capturing content, um, seeing behind the scenes of, of how a, a cow's life works, which is a lot of fun. From there, Engage was acquired back in 2013 by Publicis and became Moxie. And when we became Moxie, we were actually kind of in the in-between working on it as Engage and then over at Moxie as well. Um, but I actually had the chance to head up strategy on the Nike Women account. So that was really cool. Again, more of a social focus campaign. Did a little bit more of mobile with Nike training specifically and were able to take them for the first time from a training women's brand to a Nike women's banner, which was a really exciting time. And if you paid attention to any of the stuff that Nike's doing with women right now, it's definitely the cornerstone of their brand going forward. So really exciting stuff there. Um, also afforded me the ability to be forced to work out during the workday, which was kind of cool. So training sessions during work uh, becoming a mandatory type of thing. And then at the beginning of this year, I jumped ship from Moxie and ended up at Dragon Army. So this was a bit of a different switch for me. My background has always been more in social communications and kind of switched over to the mobile side of things. And I had spent some time working on mobile across some of our accounts, but I was never dedicated it to it in the way that I am now with Dragon Army. So what I think the cool thing and the intersection of why mobile and my background fit so well is I love people. So I love understanding what makes somebody tick. Why did they take an interaction one way versus another? Why did they decide to use an app that way? And what's really cool of what we've been able to do here is with our game studio and with the types of things that we're building for brands, it's all about understanding those motivations and those user engagements. And that's what you really see the power behind game theory doing, is understanding why does somebody continue to play that and why do they continue interacting with it in a different way. So when I first started, I know this is a text-heavy slide, but this is the slide that really got me as far as the power of mobile gaming. So I think oftentimes we think of gaming as this niche kind of marketplace. I'm not a gamer, certainly not everybody else is, but it's really mobile has turned it into this booming marketplace. So if you look at in terms of number one time spent on your phone, so if you look at across the spectrum, what are people doing in terms of the amount of time they spend in one category, it's gaming. Expected to grow to $54 billion in 2015, there are 160 million mobile gamers in the US, and 80% of money today that's going back and forth through phones is spent with in-games, in-and-out purchases. 
And this one's really exciting from an advertising perspective to me, but analysts predict that in-app ad revenues are going to actually surpass web display by 2017. So the momentum's moving in that direction. From there, it kind of opens up this question, okay, so who is that gamer? So we all have this belief that the gamer is, if you guys don't remember this video from a couple years ago, this was the kids who went nuts over their N64. So we think of a gamer as these kids, or more appropriately, probably the little boy in that picture, that a gamer is somebody who <clears throat> excuse me, sits in mom's and, mom and dad's basement, plays games all day, never leaves that cave, and that's who we're talking to in that alone. And the reality is that's not the case. So the average gamer today is 27 years old and is 50% female. So it's a huge marketplace, and for us as marketers, a huge area to tap into and just understand what people are doing within these games. I actually ran um, a search last week. I, I, I thought to search grandma and grandpa and Clash of Clans. So if you guys aren't aware, Clash of Clans is the number one game kind of out there in the mobile space right now, and I thought some of these were hilarious. So my grandpa forgot his tablet at our house, and he called to ask if I could upgrade something on his Clash of Clans account. He's 76. Uh, this grandpa is sitting next to me going hard on his Clash of Clans, waiting for his haircut, haircut, hashtag never too old. My dad, brothers, aunt, cousins, grandma, and grandpa have all been talking about Clash of Clans for the past half hour. So obviously gaming is no longer something that only happens in mom and dad's basement for teenagers. So just kind of a fun look at who's actually gaming out there in that space. So in one way or another, the way that you look at it is we're really all gamers. So whether you're not a gamer actually playing mobile games like me, but are interested in some of these other things. So if you think about the way Waze has been able to grow from a traffic perspective, the way that Nike Plus changed the way that people run as a community, or the way that Fitbit has changed the way that we track fitness, those are all games. So they encourage you to play and interact with your behavior in the real world in a different way than maybe you saw it before. So maybe it doesn't feel like a game to you underlying, but it, it really is. And it's using those principles to get you to engage in a different way. So as marketers, what can games teach us? So this is all great fun. I have a XYZ brand. I'm not going to go out and create a game for my consumers. Not on my budget for this year. So what is it that we as marketers can learn from games without actually going and turning everything we do into a game environment? So that's a little bit of what we're going to talk about today. So the big thing that games get us with is emotion, right? So the only reason that you play a game is because you enjoy it. You don't play a game because you're going to get paid for it. You don't play a game because you're going to lose weight or do something better at the end of the day. You play a game because it's fun and it gives you an escape from reality and it makes you feel something. And this is something that we as advertisers have focused on really since the beginning of advertising, right? When we create a piece of content, we put it out there with the intention of we want to make somebody feel something. So as we're going through, I want a parallel path for you, a brand example, and I'm going to go through Nike because I feel like they do a fantastic job um, of really pulling and, and used the principles of gaming to create a connection with their consumers. So I want to walk through an ad and let you guys tell me what you feel at the end of this. who ran 26.2 miles died. He died. And he was a runner. You are not a runner. You are especially not a marathon runner. But at the end of this, you will be. you feel that that really emotion in your gut and has the intent that I'm going to go out and take an action now the reality is are the majority of us going to go out and run a marathon tomorrow because we saw that ad probably not 
So what we feel like is really missing in the middle, and this is where we really feel like the game industry has, has really figured it out, is around motivation. So it's no longer enough to make somebody feel something and hope they're going to take an action. We have to figure out what's going to motivate them to actually go out and do it in the first place. So the way that we've thought about this traditionally as marketers is through your traditional persona. So as marketers, we've thought about things like, okay, we're going to develop persona X. This person is 32 years old. She's a mom. She has two kids. She drives a Lexus. Based on all of that knowledge, we're going to create a campaign and market to her. And the reality for the gaming world is it didn't work that way. So when you go out and you create a game and you push it out in the marketplace, very rarely do you ever capture customer data. So you don't know the age of your players, typically. You don't know how much money they make. You, don't, you may know where they live, but you're not going to know their interests. You don't have the information that we as marketers had. So when game developers are actually creating an experience, they have to rely solely on the fact that the experience is going to be so interesting that people are going to stick around. And then from there, their personas look a little bit different than ours. And this is what we've really tried to figure out. How can we pull those pieces and merge the two together is, for a game developer, our persona is, OK, are they an achievement-based person? Do they like to receive rewards? Do they want to level up? Are they somebody who's more personally identifiable and they want to connect with others? They're more community-driven. So if you look at a game like Clash of Clans, for instance, I could easily go through and play that game and crush every battle that I go into, earn all the different accolades, or I could be somebody who sits a bit on the sidelines and goes and helps other clans, interacts with other groups, and gets just of a great experience out of it. So for, for gamers, it's looking at what are those different paths that people are taking and what can we learn from them to develop personas that are void of this. So I'm going to talk through a little bit about one of our games, Defend the Dam, and how these things, as we think about motivation, really came into play as we were designing this. And then what are some of the learnings that you guys can pull out of it as you're taking this home for your own marketing campaigns? So you can definitely take a look at this one um, and download it for yourselves again, available in the App Store. I'm going to go ahead and play the trailer for the game for you instead of me trying to explain it to you, um, but it's a fun one. I saw what was happening, and I knew I was the only one that could stop it. And there's a lot of ground to cover. Something's not right. Something or someone has them all spooked. Well, I know that look. They're coming at me with everything they got. I'm outnumbered and outgunned. This won't be easy. Fine by me. I don't do easy. <laughs> Defend the dam. Okay, so just a little bit of a background before I get into it. Maybe you guys understand a little bit of how that game works. So, woodland creatures, animals, you're protecting a dam as they kind of rage through and are trying to break through your forces. This is just a, a bit of a background on it. So the three things that we really feel like in order to get to that core of understanding what motivates somebody are there are a couple things here. The first is identifying patterns. The second one is finding your outliers, so finding who are those weirdos, if you will, that are using the game as you didn't intend it, or the experience as you didn't intend it. And the third is then to take that insight and really model a community of super users. What do we give people so they can continue to come back and the experience never gets mundane? So as we think about the first, identify a pattern. So this is actually within the game. This is called your skills area of the game. And as we were doing some of the original tests, um, it was really interesting to see how people were using this or how they weren't using it. So one of the first things that we noticed was, even though you can see on the left-hand side there, there are a number of different weapons that you can choose from, and they all have different varying degrees of damages. But what we found was there were a couple weapons that people went to and stuck with those. They weren't necessarily going out and trying different ones. So for us, it wasn't necessarily, okay, let's move people away from that and try to get them to use different weapons. Or we could find ways to make their weapons more powerful. So a couple things here. So this is an example of the crossbow, for instance. And one of the things that you can do is as you play the game and get further in levels, you earn what are called your experience points. So that's up in the right-hand corner here. And once you get past about level 7 or 8, if you're not using these, you're not going to progress any further. I learned this the hard way. Um, Jeff, my boss who's in the audience, actually had to sit me down and was like, look, we're going to play games together because you clearly haven't figured this out yet. Um, 
But what it does is the ability to, okay, now we know that people are using this one weapon. We know that they're using the app that way. So let's not try to lead them away from it. But let's make that a more powerful example. So if we alert them to do things like lower the price of their guns, allow this gun to do more damage, allow it to pierce through characters more easily, they're going to advance more quickly in the game. So this was an example of where we really leaned into the behavior and then built the experience out because of that. The second example here is finding your outliers. So one of the things that we learned, again, as we were doing some of this early testing, we were able to look at this actually one single user. And what we found was he was going back through levels one through three and playing them over and over and over and over again. Because he had picked up on what we just walked through was the more experience you gain, the more you can up your guns. Um, now that's not necessarily a way that we want anyone to play the game first couple levels are something that you're supposed to intended to get through quickly so that you can get to the later levels that are more hard and essentially more fun. So we didn't necessarily want people to spend time there. So what we did was we took that experience of, okay, what is it that he's doing and how can we maybe deter people from taking this action? So if you see up here in the top, there's this wave example. And I think this is from like level eight or nine, actually, this wave of play. So when we originally designed the game, there were 10 waves of characters that came through. So you're seeing a wave now. When you kill all of those characters, the board essentially wipes out and you reset and you get ready for the next wave to kind of come down after you. And what we found was level seven was really the breaking point for us. We were able to look at the data and say, at what point do people either become addicted to the experience and continue on to the end of the game? Or do they drop off and leave because it's become too hard and they can't figure it out? And what we found was level seven was that breaking point for us. So we were able to, using that data and using the data of the outlier, go in and say, okay, what can we do from level seven backwards to make the experience more rich for that general population of users? And what we did was we minimized the number of waves. So if you go and play the game today, which is different from the original iteration when we tested it, level six, five, four, three, and so on have fewer waves for you to get through with the intention that the faster we can move you through those earlier waves, the faster we can get you to the fun part of the game where you're more likely to stick around. So as we think about that even from an app in a mobile space, consider that the experience is not all created equally. People aren't going to use every feature of your app in equal amounts of time or maybe in equal behavioral paths. So understanding what paths people are taking and where they're getting hung up allows us to really personalize the experience for the mass and take those people down the path that we really want them on. And then the third piece here is to model a community of super users. So of course this is the, you know, the, the golden crown, if you will, of what you want to reach. You want to reach those players who continue to play the game, they stick around and they don't ever leave, right? So one of the ways that we do this, there's a couple of, actually a couple of different ways that we can do this. We can encourage somebody to continue on and play more levels. So one of the things that we do when we build a game is we may build, so for example, 10 levels of content and release the game. But when that game is released, we have another five or 10 levels of content already built and waiting. So that when we start to see engagement drop off, we can go in and push an update and capture those users' attention without then having to scramble on the back end and say, oh my gosh, we're losing interaction, we gotta go out and build new content. The other way that we can do that is then this example of making different ways for users to play through the content. So in this example, you can see here up at the front, there's the normal mode, heroic, master, and obviously I haven't gotten any further than that. But what it shows you here is that you can play the games differently. So say I've gone through and I've completed all 30 levels of the game, I now have an opportunity to go back and play the same levels with a new level of difficulty to it. So it takes the existing content, makes it really easy for us. We didn't have to go in and produce additional content. We didn't have to go and design new levels. We just had to tweak some of the mechanics so we make it more interesting for people who want to play again and again. So like I said at the beginning, I wanted to continue through this example of Nike and you saw that, that example of that ad that really motivates you to do something. Um, for the last couple of years, Nike's really invested in their Nike Plus running app. If you're not familiar with it, it's no different than some of the others that are out there. If you look at like a Daily Mile or um, Strava or any of those others where you can really track your workouts. But what they've done a really great job of is understanding what are the mechanics that make this very game-like and getting people to stick around. 
So if you look at this middle screen, this is an example of a program that it was recommending to me based on my interaction. So they know, okay, you on average run X amount of miles per week. We know what your fastest 10K time is. We think this is a great goal for you. It wasn't necessarily an idea that, hey, here are all of these goals that you can choose from. But again, it was looking at my behavior path as a user and what can they serve me up that's going to be different than you know, the person next to me who maybe have just started or maybe is, is a marathoner. Um, also, as you look at the third screen there, I think they do a really nice job at, again, understanding users and creating that emotion to come to life even as you're tracking things. So little things like that smiley face, which on this one apparently um, was not a good run for me. When I snag this one, but you're able to go through and, and list. So was I injured? Did I feel terrible? Did I feel great? Did I feel unstoppable? They use words like that. So again, it's continuing on that path of motivation for you. And then finally, I think one of the most interesting features of the app is oftentimes as brands, when we think about the objective of something that we want to create for mobile, of course our minds go to the bottom line. I have to get my product out in front of people if I want them to buy it and become more loyal. And Nike really took the opposite effect of that. They said, you know what, our ethos is running. We want to enable people to run. And we think that the purchasing of our shoes and our product is going to be on the off side of that. And that's exactly what happened. So if you look at that last little thing with that little shoe and that 359, every time you run, it tags which shoe you were wearing. And I don't have a screenshot of it on here, but once you reach a certain threshold of miles, a pop-up will come up on that screen and it'll say, hey, guess what? Those shoes are kind of worn out and it's getting a little dangerous for you to run in them. By the way, we know based on all the shoes that you've tagged in the past, which shoes you may be interested in and here are some options that we might serve up to you. So a really interesting way to serve up content and not be forceful with it. Again, we know that mobile is such a, a personal space that you don't want to intrude on that for a person and we really have to earn their trust and this is a great way to do it with engagement ongoing. Um, so before I close out and get into kind of the why behind this, I wanted to share an example of a campaign that I actually had the opportunity to work on, did not create this content that's going to come in a second, but takes that idea of somebody's personalized data and serves it back to them in a really interesting and rewarding way. And just to give you some background on the video that I'm going to show you, this is an example of what went out to users. So they selected around 300 of their users. They didn't select the people who'd run the most miles or the people who'd run the furthest for the year, the fastest. They selected a, a different group of people who had engaged with them previously on Twitter, people who had talked to them in the past, people who had really been these engaged users in the past year, and they developed something really special for them to hit on that trigger of motivation going into 2015. Understanding that that's our breaking point. Insights start small. 
So I think often as marketers, we really try to look for that giant piece of data that's going to uncover everything for us. And what we found is, is finding those little nuggets of data and tinkering as you go is really the way to unlock and uncover that massive brand engagement that you're looking for further down the road. The second is to be imaginative. So seek ways to better understand your customer's behavior. Oftentimes when we look at, at data, especially within mobile, I think we're, we're guilty of thinking, how many downloads did an app have? How many average sessions did someone have? Try to go deeper than that. Understand and asking those questions, why did somebody follow a particular path? Why did they you know, click on our feed before they clicked on their rewards? Whatever it may be within that app experience, look for interesting ways to uncover what your users may be doing that you didn't intend them to do. And then the third piece is really to be entertaining, and, and we like to harp on this specifically at Dragon Army, of really creating rewarding experiences. And this idea that marrying emotion with motivation is what's truly going to unlock that action, that action for your user. So making sure that you're not just thinking of that first part of the puzzle of if I give somebody something really inspirational that they're going to go out and act on my behalf, we have to do a little bit more work to understand who they are and what is, what is it exactly that we can get them to do. And then finally, I just want to encourage you to never stop asking why. So this is one of the things, um, I love this image of this little girl, but this is one of those things where, you know, it's easy to say and take it at face value, okay, our goal is to drive revenue. Our goal is to get 200,000 users. But why is that? Why are we making that our goal? What do we want to understand about our users in the future? How is that going to have an impact on our roadmap? So making sure that you're asking those questions and really questioning even yourselves along the way becomes really powerful in understanding and digging into those insights that are the difference between a good experience and a great one. And that's it. That's all I have today. Um, but I can open it up for questions, I think, from here. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Uh, I noticed you very carefully didn't use the word gamification. Can you talk about why? Yeah, so not using the word gamification. So gamification is an easy one to throw on this stuff. And I didn't go into it today, but we've actually developed a whole principle of thought around what are those motivational triggers within games, and we call it applied game theory. Um, we don't use the word gamification because it's not necessarily because it's a bad thing, but I think we as marketers have made it into a bad word, right? So a couple years ago, the idea was people love games. We're going to take elements from games. We'll throw them on an experience, and people will love it. People love leaderboards. If we put a leaderboard in this or badges in this, people will flock to it. And we know that that wasn't the case. So for us, understanding motivations, personas, and thinking about people differently allows us to take those triggers like a leaderboard, like badges, like community interaction, like challenges, and layer them on top of each other to create a larger ecosystem rather than looking at one in isolation. Yes? Do you think it's more important for companies like Dragon Army to focus more on quantity or longevity? Like you're saying, have those super users and that kind of down the road, or would you rather get you know, more of a massive bottom of yeah, so that's a great question. The question was around quantity versus the longer term kind of effect. So I think it really depends on measuring what is your objective in the upfront. So for instance, there was a project that we worked on about two years ago with Chick-fil-A and LeaderCast, if you're familiar with their all-day leader event that they put on. And in that instance, the idea was to get a massive amount of users in for that day because of the experience we were going to build for them. That app wasn't going to be relevant three days down the road if they're looking at conference speakers and things that were going to be interactive with the day. So I think it's absolutely identifying what's your goal and objective in the upfront and then understanding what is that lifespan. And I think that's something that we, we often fall guilty of is, is thinking that every app is going to be around for years and years. And I think what we're finding is, is sometimes the investment can be on a smaller spend in the upfront investing in something really quick, having it live for a short period of time, learning from it, and then applying those learnings to something else. Yes? Um, so it looks like it's the Defender Games, or Defender Dam, or Defender Dam Games, mm -hmm. and I noticed that it's, it's free to download uh, as the app purchases. And I'm, I'm curious what the, uh, when you were making it, what was the, the why behind it, what, um, what are you trying to get gamers to do? Play it for a long time, buy more per, uh, buy more things, and, and along those lines, um, that one edge case you said of the guy that kept playing the same three levels, 
um, what was wrong with that? If he was having fun, was he, was he not meeting whatever the, the purpose you guys were trying to do? Yeah, so I think there are two questions there. One was around free to play versus paid and in app revenue, and then the second around that super user that was kind of our outlier, if you will. So on the first question, the majority of what you're going to see out in the app space today is free to play. I mean, there gone are the days of asking people to pay for for an app. It's just it's, it's too much of a risk of I'm going to even pay 99 cents. It's not worth it to me to find something. Um, but what that's been able to create is it's put the impetus on things like data and understanding user behaviors back on us. So it's no longer the same as if you were to design for a console game, for instance, where you sell a game at 50, 60 bucks a pop somebody buys it and then you're kind of done with that user you know you've made your money and can move on but for us we have to really understand what do people do the longer they stay in the game the more opportunities obviously we have for them to make those in-app purchases so it really depends on the game itself uh, we've been playing around with that types of revenue streams with various apps or games that we've developed so in some cases it may be in-app purchases like that and others it may be you know, in-app ads that show up. So it really depends on kind of, of what we're trying to achieve. But absolutely, I think free-to-play is, is the way that the marketplace has moved. And now it's figuring out what can we provide to users that's useful and isn't as disruptive to the experience. Um, on the question of the outlier user, it was great that he was interacting that way, but what we learned from that is we didn't want the majority of our players to play that way. So it's fantastic. If he wants to play that way, that's well and good. But what we didn't want to happen was for that tide to turn and for more people to figure out that that was the only way to play to get ahead in the game further on. Because if that's the case, it's great that he stuck around and continued to play those levels, but your average user isn't going to go through that trouble. So it was understanding, okay, what's going wrong here and catching it early so that we could manifest an experience that was going to hit a greater group of users later on. I know I saw a question here. So. Um, so how do you feel like you like you to advance this to and I would probably love to vote. How do you feel? Yeah, so the question was getting into the space without kind of having that game background and knowledge. I think it's absolutely an advantage and disadvantage. I would say in the last year I have learned more than I probably have in any other year of my career, so that's fantastic. But from a marketing perspective, there are things that we talk about with the game studio that they've never been exposed to or never thought about before, and vice versa. So I think it's just bringing a different lens into how you build and experience something. So for instance, even those data examples that I was sharing um, earlier, so when I went through and asked them to kind of share with me some stories of what they had seen, I asked the question of like, that's awesome, can we go back in and maybe do more of that? And their response was, well, we used that in the beginning when we tested the game, but we actually don't have that exact data on hand anymore. And my response is the marketing side was like, you don't have the data anymore. What do you mean you don't have the data anymore? Um, but in their sense, they were like, look, we used it to build the game, and we're moving on the next game, so we don't necessarily need it. So there's definitely those gaps that I think we complement each other in those ways. And that's been the really fun and exciting thing for me is, you know, understanding and really understanding motivations and personas and what makes people tick and what are those psychological underpinnings that exist in a game experience or in any other experience that you have are universal and you can kind of leave those across the board for sure. Yes. Uh, you get nervous about making it free to play and not creating that value by having to invest money and get into it or is it not worth really looking at market trends and yeah, so the question was, do you get nervous about um, free-to-play? I mean, absolutely, it's a gamble. I mean, you're going to spend months building this thing, and you could put it out there, and you could get five people that download it. So absolutely, it's a gamble. Um, the, the interesting thing is, is similar to what we saw with the web and SEO and some of those practices of building up downloads and really building up experience is the same thing's happening on the app space in a little bit different of a way. So it's not so much, I mean, you can go out there and buy as many users as you want. The same way now you could, you know, take Facebook, for instance, and I could go out and put as many ad dollars as I want to get something and get it in front of people. Um, but in order to get people to play, that's a different game. So a lot of what we pay attention to now is, you know, how are we garnering reviews? What are the updates that we can give to people, you know, further down the road? And then understanding, okay, at what point do we sunset an app and move on to the next one? 
So with this one, for instance, we probably won't be making too many more updates to defend the dam, but we've encouraged and, and taken those learnings and been able to apply them to the next game and the things that we're working on now. So it's absolutely a balance um, and it's absolutely a risk. And I think it's an interesting one with our setup that we can afford to do a little bit more because we do have both sides of house, which allows us to learn and apply those, even if it doesn't you know, go nuts and make us millions of dollars we can apply those learnings to client practices and things that we're using in, in other areas of the business.